everybody. Um, as Steve said, I'm Graham Daniels. Um, today we're going to be talking about the Code Manifesto. So I am a staff engineer at Refinery29. Anybody heard of Refinery29? A few people? A couple people have. Um, we're a new media company in um, Brooklyn, or in Manhattan, sorry, in New York. Um, and I always like to say, you know, they're, it's a great company to work for, and they allow me to come out here and speak to all of you. Um, I'm also a daddy. I have three children, and talk about that a lot. Um, I am a co-founder of Hack the Stigma, which is uh, an organization that tries to break down the stigma around mental illness. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit. I'm also the US lead for PHP Women, and you can find me on the internet most everywhere under that username, GrayDNLS, Twitter, GitHub, what have you. So what to expect in this talk? I'm going to talk about uh, community, inclusion, diversity, equality, and respect. We'll talk about what the problem is, why does it matter, and what you can do to fix it. There are some things that I won't cover. Um, they are important enough that they um, warrant inclusion, they warrant mention, uh, but I don't have a lot of personal experience with them, so I don't talk about it. So there are a lot of different types of diversity. This talk primarily talks about um, gender diversity. Uh, there are a number of different kinds of diversity that are very important, um, including intersectionality, um, differences in education, socioeconomic status. Um, I don't have a lot of experience with those different kinds of diversity, so I don't talk about them. It's not because they're not important. Now, why am I talking about this? Um, so. I originally started giving this talk in 2014. Um, I gave it as a lightning talk at Laracon US, and then again as a full talk at Laracon EU. Um, and when I originally gave this talk, I was presenting as a woman. So I am a trans man. I transitioned in May of this year. Um, but I lived the majority of my life as, uh, as a woman in tech, um, the majority of my career as a woman in tech. Um, and I talk about this stuff because it's very important. Um, and I know back when I was presenting as a woman, I was very um, active in the community, fighting for diversity. Um, I was very outspoken about it. I still am. But had I been in the audience at a talk of some random white dude on stage trying to tell me about gender diversity, um, kind of glaze over a little bit. I talk about this because I have now seen both sides. Uh, it's still very important. Um, and I've seen firsthand what the difference looks like. So with that, we can talk about what is the problem. Ooh. You have to excuse my slides. I transferred this to PowerPoint, and it looks like some of the fonts dropped out. So excuse this. Uh, the industry that I work in is not the industry that I want to work in. Uh, this is a quote for me when I gave that first lightning talk in Laracon, uh, New York, in 2014. It is completely OK to quote yourself in your own slides, by the way. Um, and what I mean by this is not that I don't love our industry, because I do. I love what I do for a living. I love getting up and going to work every day. I love solving problems. The things I do with my time are amazing, and tiny little baby Graham could never have hoped to do something this amazing with my life and my career. That said, there is a lot of work to be done for diversity, for all of the interpersonal things that people deal with. Um, this industry is not perfect by far, and I, I want it to be better. So in a nutshell, our industry is greatly lacking in diversity. Uh, the diversity that we do have is often pushed out. So we don't have a lot of diversity numbers. The numbers are horrifying, and we'll go through some of those. But in addition to that, um, we don't the diversity that we do have, those small numbers, are often pushed out and leaving the industry for a number of different reasons. <clears throat> now, this problem is twofold. We have a pipeline problem, and we have a culture problem. Now, this is how I see it. And again, with the formatting, sorry about that. Um, a lot of times, people focus on the pipeline and not the culture, because the pipeline is somebody else's problem. It's not necessarily our problem. And if we just say that it's a pipeline problem, then we don't have to worry about fixing our culture today. We don't have to worry about fixing what's going on right now. We can just worry about, well, you know, nobody's applying 
I can't get the applicants. I don't have diversity at my company because you know women and minorities just don't apply, and it's a pipeline problem and not my problem. Um, there's been a lot of, of stories coming out. I think Facebook at one point a few months ago put out a, a story that TLDR was, you know, nobody applies. It's a pipeline problem. <coughs> And that's very problematic because it doesn't address the very severe problems with our culture. Stopping at the pipeline puts all of the responsibility on future generations, and that is not acceptable. Um, it's not our kids' problem, it's not the next generation's problem, it's not our grandchildren's problem, this is very much our problem, and we need to fix it now, or at least work on fixing it now. Sorry, these slides are, are not great. <laughs> um, so when we talk about the pipeline, the statistics say that less than 12% of computer science bachelor's degrees went to women. And that 12%, when women make up more than 50% of um, the population in, as, as a whole, we have 12% of degrees, bachelor's degrees going to women in a computer science field. Now, I'm going to go through the next slides rather quickly, and it's not the numbers that are necessarily important that I want you to look at, but pay attention to the pattern that you'll see. So these are from the major players. We've got Facebook, Twitter, Google, Apple, Microsoft. And you can see in all of these slides that the big Pac-Man looking red blobs are all about the same throughout them, and that, of course, they're not labeled because they don't need to be. You can infer from the slides that those are mostly white, mostly male companies. So what's the problem with having a mostly white, mostly male workforce in our industry? When you have a homogenous um, industry, when you have a homogenous workforce, you don't get all of the perspectives available. You don't solve all the problems that you could solve because you're getting one perspective, or primarily one perspective. And these are you know, the giants in our industry, and they all have the same. Now, are these really problems, or are they symptoms? And I think it's a, a measure of both, but pertaining specifically to the pipeline, it's more a symptom. I think we can go further back, that far back. And having conversations recently, maybe Legos is not that far back for everyone, but talking about children's toys. These Legos are amazing Lego sets. Um, as I mentioned, I have three children. Two of them are boys. My boys love playing with these sorts of things. And if you go to a toy store and you go into the boys' aisle, you'll see things like this. And those are amazing. Like that, that Batman set up there is fantastic. Now, for any of you who have daughters, if you go into the girls' section of a toy store, this is what you see. It's a barrage of pink. I hate that section in the toy store. I've hated that section in the toy store my whole life. Um, it's lots of like dolls. They have like house making and cleaning products for little girls to play with. And there's nothing wrong with teaching our, our little girls to nurture and teaching our little boys to play with Legos and love Batman. That's fine. But what you don't realize, at least what I didn't realize, because I, like I said, I have three children. My daughter is going to be 11, so she's, she's 10. My boys are five and six. Um, as a parent, you know, I want the best for my children, and it didn't necessarily occur to me even that Lego blocks, building blocks, those sorts of things, they're not just toys. They build spatial reasoning skills. They teach our kids how to build things, how to solve problems. And as software engineers, that is a pretty crucial skill. You do that all day. You write code blocks that fit together much like Legos fit together, and you build things that are really cool like retro Batman sets. So we're conditioning our children from a very young age in, most, in ways most of us don't realize. Um, it never occurred to me that by you know, taking my little girl into the girl's aisle and taking my little boy into the boy's aisle that I was possibly teaching them different skills. It, had, it took some time to sit down and think about what I'm doing. And I don't think the onus on that falls necessarily fully on the heads of the parents. A lot of it has to do with societal things, with the marketing that we see out there. Um, but there, there's a lot of stigma that comes around our toys, and I think it's very important to be cognizant of how much we're conditioning our children from such a very, very young age um, and how that can affect their later lives. 
But we also have a culture problem. And I will spend the majority of this talk talking about the culture problem that we have because I think it is very important and it's something that doesn't get um, enough attention because people are, as I mentioned, so apt to jump on the idea of it being a pipeline problem and stop there. So there are two kinds of discrimination from the way that I see it. You have explicit discrimination, and this stuff is disgusting. Um, it's really dangerous stuff, but it's usually easy to, to spot and easy to explain. Now, I don't know how many of you are on Twitter or avid Twitter users, but I myself am a huge Twitter user. I use Twitter constantly. Um, of all the social media networks, that's my favorite, but I guess there's plenty of them out there now. Uh, but when my phone goes off, when it dings, somebody tweeted me. That's a little spark of excitement, like, hey, some random person on the internet wanted to say something to me. That, that makes you feel good. Uh, and I don't know if you've seen on Twitter the things that I've seen. And it's in other platforms, too. It's not something that's necessarily just Twitter. You see it on Reddit, um, sometimes on Facebook, definitely on YouTube. Um, death threats, rape threats, uh, people, usually random strangers, saying unspeakable things to women on the internet for the audacity of being a woman on the internet and having an opinion, usually. Um, so can you imagine, you know, your phone dings, doo -doo, you've got mail, you've got a message, hello, and you open up that phone and what you see is a random stranger telling you that he wants to kill you or that he knows where you live or he or she, it's not always men that do these things, um, you know, knows where your family lives. You know, I'm, I'm a son and a brother and a father. I have a family and if somebody tweeted me on the internet and told me that he knows where my mother lives, I cannot even imagine, I can't fathom the just gut-wrenching horror that that would bring me. And it happens all the time. Now, the flip side of that is, if there is a silver lining to something so disgusting, when you see something like that on the internet and you show it to someone and say, look at this, most decent human beings will say, okay, that's a problem, that's wrong, that's gross, that's bad. Now. All of these things I've seen, literally, death threats, rape threats, hate speech, doxing, if you don't know what doxing is, it's the release of your pr uh, pr private information on the internet, usually in a big dump, things like where your mother lives, where your parents live, your address, things of that nature, it's very dangerous. Now the other side is implicit. So this stuff is insidious, it's ingrained in all of us, and it's really hard to see and even harder to explain. So. These are the things where it's just commonplace. Most women that I've met know it, because it happens to them every day. Um, things like questioning your competence, um, mansplaining, and I'll go into a lot of these things in a little bit. Um, but these ones are really, really hard to explain to people. It's hard to get people to believe you or believe that it's a problem because it's not something as blatant as a death threat or a rape threat or a threat against your, your safety. So, some things that you hear as a female developer. Now, all the things that I, I will go through either have been said to me directly or said to close friends that I know. And they're all pretty good examples of the insidious kind of discrimination that you see. So, you're a developer and you're a girl. You're a unicorn. I've been called a unicorn many, many, many times in my career. This one came from a colleague of mine who was paying me a compliment. You're the first woman I've worked with and I'm impressed by how competent you are. <clears throat> I was flabbergasted at this. Um, you know, we were, we were pair programming, we'd been working together for about a year at that point, and he turns to me and he says this, and he's paying me a compliment, he's saying something nice to me. And I, so what, what he really said, or at least what I really heard was, for the last year, I thought you were incompetent. Or I immediately thought you were incompetent just because I happened to walk into the room being a woman. You're a pretty good coder for a girl. 
If you ever feel the need to suffix any sentence ever with you're a pretty good coder for a girl, or with your, for a girl, don't do it. Stop. For a lady, for a woman, for anything. On the other side, I would never tell somebody, you're a good developer for a man. That's ridiculous. Why would you say that? You shouldn't. But they do, and they think that they're paying you a compliment. Girls don't like to solve problems, which is complete and utter BS. It's an utter falsehood. Um, this one actually came, I believe it was an, uh, an article on TechCrunch. Google was doing one of their like girls who code event type things, trying to get young girls into coding. And one of the interviewers was uh, interviewing an organizer on video. And she said, I know girls don't like to solve problems, so how are you getting over that? What? I spent the majority of my life as a girl. I do like to solve problems. I did. I know lots of women. Um, you know, I mentioned I worked at Refinery29. We have a team of about 25 engineers, and we have 40% gender diversity. So 40% of the engineers I work with are women, and they all like to solve problems. They're all brilliant, some of them, most of them, much smarter than me, solving problems that are great and hard and difficult and fun, and they enjoy it. Sorry, the slides on that one are a little messed up. Uh, girls make great front-end developers because they like to make things pretty. This one's a layer cake of what the hell. Uh, number one, it's an insult to front-end developers. I am a back-end engineer. Um, I build back-end services. I build APIs. I like it. I'm good at it. I couldn't front-end my way out of a box. I recently tried to teach myself React, and it made me want to cry, because front-end development is some weird magic. No. So the idea that front-end developers only make things pretty is insulting to front-end developers. Furthermore, the idea that girls are specifically good at that because we like to make things pretty is also ridiculous. Um, I worked for a small startup in Raleigh, North Carolina, and I was a senior back-end developer. I built APIs, just as I do now. Um, and the CTO of the company, or sorry, CFO, the guy who signs the paychecks, the, the money man, had hired a new accountant and was bringing her around to teach her at all the staff and stops at my desk and he says, oh, hey, you know, this is so-and-so. Uh, they make things look good. Like, what? No. I mean, first of all, you sign my paycheck and you have no idea what I do for you, so I guess I'm just going to sit around for a while. Uh, but just the assumption, and, and it didn't click in my head that that was the assumption he had made because I was a woman at the time that I liked to make things prettier, that I was good at making things pretty. Um, it wasn't until I mentioned this to my manager at the time, I was like, yeah, you know, this guy said this thing and that's really stupid. And he was like, oh, he probably assumed it's just because you're a girl. And at that point it clicked and I said, really? He was like, yeah, you know, most front end engineers are women. That's false. Now, some things that you experience as a female engineer. And I've experienced most of these things, or close friends of mine have. So, missing promotions. Now, a lot of people will say that, like, oh, you think that you should get a promotion just because you're a woman, or you want things handed to you. That's poppycock. It's not the case at all. But I've been in situations where I watched a woman who had been with the company four years, <clears throat> the most tenured person on her team, uh, a promotion became available, and one of her team members was given the promotion without her ever even knowing that the promotion was available. So somebody who had been there less time with less experience in the company was now her boss, and she hadn't even been told the position was available. <clears throat> Being talked over in meetings, that sucks. You're literally speaking, and you get interrupted. Sometimes it comes with the added icing of like a hand chop, that's nice, or like pointing at you while you're talking. Um, that's happened to me a lot. It's happened, I've seen it happen to other people a lot. Um, and it's upsetting. Um, you feel disrespected. And most people don't realize it's happening. <clears throat> you're either aggressive or whiny when you're a woman in tech. Um, if you're complaining about a problem, it's one of these two things. There is really no middle ground. You're either whining or you're being words that I can't say on stage. And that's hard. Like, how do you, 
How do you stand by your convictions? How do you make a point? How do you argue for a solution when every time you do it, you're told that you're whining or being too aggressive? You need to be less aggressive. The guy that was just talking over me in a meeting, arguing his point, doesn't need to be less aggressive, but I do. That's ridiculous. <clears throat> Immediately assume that you're incompetent as the person that I was paying me a compliment, clearly illustrated, like you, you spend all the time trying to prove your competence. There was a, a tweet, and maybe it was a quote, I see most of my quotes on Twitter, uh, but there was a, a tweet that went out around recently that said, um, most competent women pray, or it was, God grant me the confidence of a, an incompetent man. Nobody automatically assumes, they're not nobody, but usually men are not automatically assumed incompetent but it happens to women all the time. Sexual harassment. This happens in the workplace way more than it should. And it's not always <clears throat> the, the really gross stuff. Like, you know, if you're being grabbed in the workplace, that's obviously unacceptable. And it's one of those, like, the difference between explicit and implicit. But <clears throat> I've had colleagues who've been told things like, I'm really glad you work here. I like tall women. What? Uh, or you should wear your hair down more. You look prettier like that. At work, in the workplace. And when you complain about things like that, nine times out of 10, you will be told that you are being too sensitive. Or he was paying you a compliment. He told you you were pretty. You should just say thank you. No. I mean, how would it be if a woman walked up to a man and said, I'm glad you work here. I like buff guys or, or short guys or... You know, like, I like the way those pants look on you. That's ridiculous. It's not the sort of thing that you would say in a workplace, but it happens to women all the time. And they're told, you're too sensitive. Get over it. Say thank you. He was being nice to you. It's disgusting. <clears throat> Recruiting. This bothered me when I presented as a woman. It bothers me now. If I read a job posting, and, you know, they have the, like, you know, about the company, about the position, and then about our ideal candidate, and it's, it's getting better, but it's still about 30% of the job postings that I read say, this guy, I don't care what you say, guys is not a gender neutral term. You would never talk to a woman and say, call her a guy in a singular. You cannot talk to a mixed gendered group of people and call them guys. It's just not okay. It's annoying. But in a job posting where it says this guy, in those two words, you've already told all female applicants that you're not the one, they're not the one you're looking for. It's ridiculous. It's gross. Um, there are a lot of things that I always saw as a smell that you see in recruiting um, that I kind of shied away from as a woman. I still do when I'm reading things as a man just because it's not the kind of culture that I want to go into. But um, when you have frequent, like some job postings will say like, oh, frequent after parties. You know, we get together as a team and go drinking a lot. A lot of women aren't going to feel safe out with a bunch of dudes drinking all the time. Um, kegerators in the office, those are things that I look for. Um, things of that nature, and it happens in recruiting. In marketing, now I have been very fortunate, and probably the conference organizers that have me speak and attend their conferences have been very fortunate, that I've never seen a boost babe in the wild. But I've heard of them. This is a marketing ploy where you get really attractive women to shill your product in tight clothing. It's disgusting. It's disgusting and it is offensive. It's offensive to women, it's offensive to me and a lot of other men, decent people that understand that women aren't marketing tools and shouldn't be used as such. But you see it all the time. Um, like GoDaddy commercials. I don't think I've ever seen a GoDaddy commercial that wasn't disgusting. I won't use them. Not only is their service crap, but their marketing is awful. If their service was the best service ever and their marketing was what it is, still wouldn't use them. There are dozens of examples of marketing in our industry, marketing to developers, where they're definitely marketing to that mostly white, mostly male demographic. And a lot of the times they use women to do it. And 100% of the time, that's gross. Mansplaining. I mentioned this a little bit. Uh, a lot of people will tell you mansplaining doesn't exist. I can tell you it does. I can tell you it's gross, and it's disrespectful, and it feels demoralizing when it happens to you. 
but I have a pretty cool example of it, if you can see it. Um, now, Twitter, I actually took this screenshot after I transitioned, so it's got my man name on there, but uh, this actually, I tweeted it when I was presenting as a woman. And if you can read my original tweet, it was a funny haha. -ha. When in doubt, pseudo chmod 777. Now, keep in mind, my profile says I'm a staff engineer at Refinery29. It's a fairly large company. We have a fairly large staff. Staff engineer is a fairly competent person. One would assume that I would know. You don't do that. Uh, but I got, this was one of about a dozen responses that I got that said, haha, nope, and then literally mansplained me with man commands. Man ch mod, man ch own, man whatever the hell it is. Uh, and then more about how to Google things. Set up unmasked, blah, 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 because I don't know this. Obviously, I don't know this. Um, I don't have a screen cap of it because it happened very recently, but uh, a male friend of mine tweeted pretty much the same thing that I did and got a lot of, ha ha, that's funny. People will automatically assume that you don't know what you're talking about. Um, my, my wife is a uh, principal engineer at AOL. She's 10 times more brilliant than I will ever be. Um, she's, I eat killer bees on Twitter. If you haven't followed her, you don't know her, you definitely should because she's amazingly worth it. Uh, but she tweeted recently, and she's been doing this for 20 years, like forever. Um, she tweeted recently about copying um, Git hashes into her notebook. And someone was like, oh, you know that you can tag commits on Git, right? Yes. Yes, she knows. Um, her, her ladiness is not getting in the way of that. But oftentimes, um, things like this, simple, simple things get explained to you. Um, I had a, a colleague, another example, I had a colleague where um, one of our, our, and she was a junior engineer, but still, I, I expect a certain level of competence of every engineer. Um, she was asking a question, and his response was, well, do you know SQL? We work on a LAMP stack every day. Like, that's our job. I would assume that any engineer, interns, should know SQL. Like, that's not a question that you should ever ask anyone, ever. Um, and when I talked to him about it, because I did, I mentioned it, I was like, that's not acceptable. You can't ask her that. Uh, and, and her response at the time was, yeah, I've known SQL since uni, since university, because obviously she has. Um, and he was like, oh, I didn't think about it. Like, it doesn't seem offensive to me. And I was like, well, maybe that's because your competence isn't questioned every single day. That it doesn't seem offensive to you, but it, it was pretty gross. Now, male privilege. I spent a lot of time when I was writing this talk thinking about how to properly explain male privilege. It's kind of a hard thing to explain. It's a hard thing to grasp. So how do you correctly explain this? And then it hit me. I've been up here right, right now rambling for about 15, 20 minutes about all the things that you experience as a female developer uh, out in the wild. If you've never had any one of those 20 things happen to you, you've got it. That's it. That's what male privilege is. It's never having to deal with any one of those horrible, awful, ridiculous things. Now, if you were born a man, You've had it since you were born. I wasn't. I've been rocking this male privilege for about six months now. And I can tell you there is a marked difference. Fewer people talk over me in meetings. Fewer people question my competence. Fewer people argue with me about my ideas. And really nothing else has changed about me. My voice dropped a little bit. Uh, my presentation changed. I cut my hair. Starting to grow a little chin hair at this point, which is pretty cool. But that's about it. So a lower voice, a different presentation, and a couple chin hairs, and people respect me more. That's it. And it's gross. And every time someone doesn't question my competence, every time I don't have to fight to get my voice heard or my idea understood or someone to agree that I know what I'm talking about, I'm happy, of course. But I'm also sad because I remember what it was like. And I don't deserve this to be that much easier after doing that little. It's not like in the last six months I got a master's degree in computer science. It's not like I learned so much more just by being a dude person. I don't deserve for it to be that much easier. And really what it is is they don't deserve for it to be that much harder. Now you get not all men. 
So I'm a man and I don't do those things. I have a lot of friends that are men and they don't do those things. I'm raising two boys and God help them if they ever do any one of those things. So no, it's not all men. And any time that you stand up and you say like, you know, a man harassed me or men harassed me or, you know, as a woman I'm walking down the street and I get catcalled constantly, you have a dozen people will pop up and say, not all men. Okay, obviously, I don't think anyone, or at least the majority of people that talk about the things that happen to women are saying every single man ever does this. They're not damning every male person on the planet because there's a bunch of them that are jerks. And saying not all men takes away, you're, you're taking away the problem, you're ignoring the problem. Instead of addressing a very serious problem, you're saying, well, I don't do that, so it's not a problem. And that's not fair. You see a lot of times that minorities creating safe spaces for themselves, um, somehow a lot of people will think that that's threatening the majority, and it's not the case. You can have women's engineering groups, you can have safe places for women, and it's not a threat to the majority at all. So, now why does any of this matter? The culture problem is a problem, the pipeline problem is a problem, but why does it really matter? You know, things, things are working. If it's not broke, don't fix it. What's the problem, right? Let's think about what we do for a living. I'm gonna assume you're all here at a, a web developers conference, an engineers conference. I'm gonna assume that most of you in the room are engineers or engineer adjacent. What we do is magic. Like that. Literally, every day. Think about it. You sit down into a computer and you smash out some keys. To a lay person, it looks like gibberish. Sit down and try to explain that to somebody who's not an engineer and it looks like absolute nonsense. And yet we do that and then you, know, you compile it or you deploy it or however you do based on whatever language you're working on and you made the internet. People just like you made the internet. I have a microcomputer in my pocket. This thing can do amazing, amazing things. And it was built by people like us. That's magic. Go watch some 1960s sci-fi shows, and they got this, right? This is magic. This, this, this video calling, I was doing a, a video call with my, my wife this morning uh, from Croatia to Brooklyn. Uh, we were complaining because the connectivity sucked. But think about that. You know, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, that was sci-fi. And now we can do it, we can do it, and we can complain about how bad it is. I think about that every time I complain about, about video chat, like just how sci-fi it is and how, how entitled I am that I take it for granted and complain about it. But it's magic, and it was magic that was built by people like us. The next generation of magic that's coming will be built by people like us. And how privileged are we to be able to do that? Like not only do I get to do this really, really cool, awesome stuff, but people pay me to do it. That's awesome. Now, software engineering careers are flexible. So I'm here in Croatia. I've been in Croatia since Tuesday. Um, I'll be here until Sunday. When I get back, I'm flying out to the Netherlands. That's pretty flexible. My boss lets me do this. Uh, but day-to-day -day flexibility. You know, I'm a, I'm a father. I've got three kids for a significant amount of time. I was a single father with three kids. And when I applied for my job, I said, okay, look, this is great. I want to work for you. I want to do great things. I think it's going to be fun. But kids are first priority. And at 1.30 every afternoon, I'm going to leave, and I'm going to go get my kids, and I'll work from home in the afternoon. Didn't bat an eye. Okay. We have a lot of engineers on our team, uh, both men and women who are parents and take time for their kids. If my kid is sick, um, it's fine. If last year I went on two field trips, I took my son to the petting zoo with his school. Not a problem. Uh, we have a very results-driven environment. It's very flexible. In other jobs, that's not the case. I worked in sales to put myself through school to become a software engineer. You didn't miss work ever for any reason. Didn't matter if your kid had the plague. Like, after your sick days were done, they were done. And maybe that's kind of an American thing, but it's pretty strenuous. High paying. I don't know about you all, uh, but... I never imagined that you could make the kind of money that software engineers make. I grew up in a trailer park, uh, you know, hovering right around that poverty line as a kid. I never dreamed that I could live in Brooklyn 
uh, that I could work in Manhattan, that I could make the kind of money that our, our, our industry makes. High demand. So, you know, I'm, I'm privileged to live in New York City, which is a very, very tech-friendly city. It's very booming. There are lots of jobs. But I have recruiters calling me weekly, if not several times a week. You know, they bang down your door. Like, take a minute and think about it. Recruiters oftentimes will complain, or sorry, engineers will complain about recruiters. Like, oh, this jerk emailing me, blah de blah de blah. I didn't even look at my resume, blah de blah de blah de blah. Can you think of another industry where people are literally knocking on your door to give you a job? That doesn't happen, ever. I remember the first time a tech recruiter ever contacted me, I was gobsmacked, because in sales and other industries, you have to hunt for jobs. Isn't that a novel concept? They don't just come to you and say, hey, do you want to work for us? But these recruiters, especially in New York, it's not just like, hey, I saw your resume, I want to offer you a job, but it's like, how are they treating you at Refinery? You get free lunches, they cover your insurance, you have massages, what about parking? Like, they are willing to offer you ridiculous things. This doesn't happen in other industries. Oh. Again, with the formatting, sorry. Uh, this is the medium household income, um, and a lot of this stuff is US, but it does translate fairly well. Uh, probably not the, the American dollars, but. That's the median household income in the US. That's the average salary for a software engineer in the US. That's the average salary for a senior software engineer. So just a software engineer, entry-level software engineer, you're 40%, 47% above median average. A senior engineer is 91% above median average. And a entry-level software engineer is 326% above the poverty level. So again, I grew up rather poor, hovering right around that poverty level. We were in lower middle class uh, in a trailer park. And Statistically, I make 326% more than poverty level. That's impressive. Like, that, that is privilege right there. What are we going to tell our kids? And for me, this is what it all really boils down to. You ask me why this matters. It matters for me. Uh, it matters for all of the women that I know in our industry. I have a great many female engineering friends. Um, and it matters for them. I don't like that they're mistreated. I don't like that I was mistreated. I don't like that their lives are harder. But this is really, TLDR, why it matters so much to me. Why I get up here and I give these kind of talks and why I try so much to advocate for diversity. I wasn't lying. Photographic evidence, those are my kids. They're adorable. Uh, that's Matthew, Lydia, and Sean. They are six, 11, and five. I wanna look at my kids and say, you can do anything you want to do, anything at all. You want to be an astronaut, that's fine. You want to be a doctor, you want to be a lawyer, you want to be an architect, you want to be a software engineer, you want to do what daddy does, I want to tell them that it's okay and that they can, and I'll teach them how to do it. I don't want to say, you two can, but you. I mean, you can if you want to, but it'll be hard. And I can tell you what my dad told me as a tiny girl child person. Thick skin, kid. Have a thick skin. Keep your chin up. That's a horrible thing to have to tell a child. And I don't want to tell her that. I won't tell her that. I won't tell her that in order to exist in an industry doing what I do, and she sees me do it. She sees how much I love doing it. She wants to do it. I don't want to tell her, you're going to need a thick skin. I don't want to tell her, like, it's fine, but don't look at Reddit, ever. No. I don't want to tell her that. I don't want to tell my sons that. I don't, we shouldn't have to. Parents shouldn't have to tell their children that. My daughter is 10, she'll be 11 in March. When I started giving this talk, um, she was nine. So at that point, we had nine years to fix it. She's about to be 11, time is running out. By the time my daughter is old enough to enter this industry, we need to have this problem fixed. For my daughter, for all the other daughters. There's also invisible minorities. Um, now, for most minorities, you can see on site someone's a minority. It's usually fairly easy to tell someone's a woman or someone's um, a person of color. But there are invisible minorities out there that you won't know unless someone tells you. So I talked about hacks of stigma. Um, I suffer from anxiety and bipolar disorder. Um, you wouldn't know that unless I told you. 
For me specifically, you might know that because I blog about it a lot and I talk about it a lot. But most people won't tell you. There is a great amount of stigma around mental health issues, and there's also a, a pretty big Venn diagram between people with mental health issues and, and people in development. Um, there have been some studies done about people in our industry falling along, like somewhere along the autism spectrum. Um, there are a lot of outreach programs for developers with mental illnesses. Um, if you haven't heard of Open Sourcing Mental Illness by Ed Finkler, I highly suggest you check it out. It's amazing, um, but it's a significant problem in our industry, and it's something that you wouldn't know unless someone told you. You don't know the struggle that somebody had to go to to get where they are, and when I say where they are, sometimes that means on a conference call on a Tuesday morning. I had plenty of instances where literally the effort it took to roll over in my bed and grab my laptop was more than I could muster. Had, I could not even. I was negative in the evens department. Couldn't do it today. Um, there were some days where I could barely do it. I barely was able to get up, get dressed, get to work, and sit in a conference room to have a meeting. You don't want to be the person that adds on to that. You have imposter syndrome. There's a lot more people talking about this now. Um, if you're not familiar with what imposter syndrome is, it's the feeling that you're faking it, that all the success you've had is due to luck, and you don't really know what you're doing. Studies have shown that imposter syndrome is much more pre prevalent in women and persons of color, probably because um, in addition to your own senses of imposter syndrome, it's enhanced from the outside reinforced from the outside repeatedly, constantly, day in and day out. Um, there's this idea of a worth it scale that I have. So you, you come into this industry and you have pros and cons. And so on the pro side, you get the magic. Passion, learning, problem solving. Got your pros way up here. Things are going great. You love your job. You love this industry. You love what you do for a living. Then you get disrespected, you get tired, you get harassed, you get self-doubt, and eventually the scale will tip, and it's not worth it anymore. Women leave our industry nearly two times the rate of men. So that's what I talked about. The diversity that we do have is leaving. We are hemorrhaging women from our industry based on our culture. It's not okay. So what you, can you do about this? This is not a woman's problem. It's not a minority's problem. It's also not a man's problem. This is everybody's problem. We're all hurt by it, whether you know it or not, and we can all help fix it. You don't need to be a minority to empower minorities. You can do it through advocacy, empowerment, and encouragement. These things happen through uh, genuine engagement. Now, there are a lot of anti-solutions out there. Anti-solutions are a lot like anti-patterns -pattern that we're you know, familiar with. People in software engineering talk about anti-patterns a lot. They look or sound really good. They don't actually solve the problem. And a lot of times they cause more harm than good. So the shiny unicorn syndrome, treating female engineers like they're unicorns, is problematic. Kitty gloves. I once sat in a code review um, at a startup that I worked in, and we used to do group code review. So it was a small team, there were about five of us, and once a week we'd go in and you'd put up on the, the screen something you'd been working on that week and then you'd review it as a team. And a colleague of mine put up his stuff and our manager laid into him. What were you thinking? This is ridiculous, it's gross, it's horrible, it's disgusting, it's awful. Um, and that's a horrible way to do code reviews, please don't ever do that. But then I put my code up on the screen and he looked at me and goes, well, you tried. What? Like, if you're going to be a deplorable human being and give that kind of disgusting, unhelpful code review where you're just gutting the person, which, again, don't do that, because it's gross. But if you're gonna do it, do it to everyone. Like, was he afraid he was gonna make me cry or something? That was, it was gross. And it made the person who just got reamed hate me even more, because I was getting preferential treatment that I didn't ask for. And it didn't make my code any better, either. Pink washing. So you see this a lot. Usually a lot of big companies will do this, where they're like, girls who code, girls who code, and gir not girls who code specifically, because girls who code is great, but they do you know, female coding events. Um, and usually it's just appending everything with four women, which is awful, um, or 
we're going to teach little girls how to code, and we'll teach them how to make bracelets. Like, you can make connected bracelets. Or we'll teach you how to use software to, like, design dresses and stuff. It's gross. It's disgusting. If you want to teach little girls how to solve problems, teach them to solve the same kind of problems that you're teaching little boys to solve. Just invite them to the same things that you're already doing. You don't have to pink wash it. Quotas are bad, period. If you are ever uh, hiring, if you're ever organizing a conference, if you're ever doing anything where you're trying to get a group of people together and somebody suggests, let's have a quota, no. No. I never want to be on stage and have somebody wonder if I'm up there to fill a quota. Uh, you know, there's not really much room for a white guy quota, uh, but you know, if there was a trans man quota, I don't want to be on stage filling a trans man quota. And before I transitioned, I would never want to be on stage filling a female quota. They're gross and disrespectful. So the code manifesto, something that I came up with, it's not a solution to the problem, but I think it is a, a step in the right direction. If there were a solution to the problem, it'd be solved by now. There's no light switch to fix this. So there are values and not actions. There are eight of them. Um, it started out as six. Two of them have been submitted um, via open source because it is open source and on GitHub. There are two major themes to this. You have respect and then giving back. So it's two parts, to improve our current culture and then also to help our culture, uh, the, the ones who come after us. <sighs> so discrimination limits us. It's number one, because in my mind it is the most important. Immediately disqualifying more than half the population is nothing short of insane. It's bonkers. Why would you do it? That includes discrimination on a range of different things. Um, when I first wrote this, that list was about half as long because even in my quest to improve diversity, I didn't understand all the different kinds of diversity there are out there. And a lot of these have been added by the open source community. Boundaries honor us. Boundaries are healthy. Everyone's are different. Um, you know, I'm a hugger. I don't mind hugging people. I'll hug just about anybody. Some people are not. It's important. Um, if you step over a boundary that's a normal human thing, they're going to tell you and then respect that. It's pretty straightforward. We are our biggest assets. So none of you were born masters of your trade. Not even, you know, Zuckerberg or Steve Jobs or any of those people. You didn't pop forth from your mother's womb as genius. You were taught. So return that favor, and you can do that in a number of different ways. Write a blog post, answer a question, make a screencast, start a podcast, give a talk like this up here. Make a pull request, give a code review, write an open source package. All of those ways are ways to give back to help the next generation. We are resources for the future. This one's really powerful to me and kind of scary. So you think of who you looked up to as a child, as a small engineer, just starting in your career, you know, Zuckerberg or Jobs or, um, you know, Rasmus Lerdorf or Ada Lovelace, whoever you looked up to. Uh, you're that for the next generation. Engineers just like you, just like us, we will be role models for the people who come after us. It's important to be mindful of that. Make yourself a resource to help them. Respect defines us. So this is one of the ones where it's kind of silly that we have to say it, but we have to say it. It's pretty much the golden rule. Treat others as you wish to be expected. Or, bleh, bleh. Treat others as you wish to be treated. Make your discussions, criticisms, and debates from a point of respect. Ask yourself, is it true, is it necessary, and is it constructive? I ask myself that all the time. There are a number of tweets and comments on pull requests and code review and a number of different things that I do that get deleted because they don't pass that litmus test. Anything other than that is untolerated, or it should be. Reactions require grace. So the development community, the engineering community, has a habit of doing this. Uh, somebody says something stupid on Twitter or writes a stupid blog post, and we immediately turn it up to 11. Some re reactions are OK. Curiosity, passion, love for what you do, a lot of those things are what feed into that turning it up to 11. Those things are OK. Things that aren't OK, hate, 
anger, burn it with fire. Those are not okay reactions. Opinions are just that, they're opinions. This was the first uh, open source contributed. It was contributed by Artisan Goose. Um, that's his Twitter handle. Just the idea of understanding that everyone has opinions and that they're okay. Everyone is entitled to their opinion. To err is human. Some mistakes are just mistakes. We all need to be able to make mistakes. If we weren't able to make mistakes, if you didn't put yourself out there, if you never tried, because you might fail, because you might make a mistake. Uh, a lot of the things that we have now wouldn't have come to be. A lot of the things that we have now are mistakes. It's not what somebody meant to do, but they tried, they put themselves out there. We need to be able to make mistakes. And if we have graceful reactions, then making mistakes is okay. And then we learn from them. Hatred rarely inspires growth. If you turn it up to 11, if somebody says something stupid on Twitter, you immediately turn it up to 11 and lash out at them with hate and anger and those sorts of things. If you're not giving them the room to make a mistake and learn from it, they're not going to learn. They're not going to grow. Usually it'll just turn into another cycle of, of hate. You hate them and then they get mad and they get defensive and they're not gonna learn anything. It's not a good way to improve anyone's culture. So you can go to thecodemanifesto.com and you can put in your name and hundreds of people have done this so far uh, and I appreciate each and every one of them, but it's not enough. Submitting web forms is cheap. We all do it every day, probably dozens of times a day, signing up for random this and random that, and this newsletter that's going straight into your trash. You're never gonna read it. Smoting the Code Manifesto isn't enough. You have to live it, remember it, keep it top of mind, think about it. Um, I wrote it because I really felt that if people would incorporate these values into their everyday lives, it would make our culture a better place. For me, I think it's made me better, um, more empathetic at least, more thoughtful in the communications that I have. Other things that you can do. Stand up, literally every single time. And that's difficult, it's not easy to do. There have been plenty of times where, you know, I've stood up at work or at a meetup or at a conference. It didn't feel good to do it. You know, I've seen people you know, when someone is in a meeting over, speaking over someone, standing up and saying, hey, like, she was talking. Shh. You know, telling someone that you can't ask engineers whether or not they know SQL because it's rude. Stop it. Um, every time. It's important that people see the majority stand up and say that this isn't okay. Know your own bias. Um, that's a difficult one. When I first started down this you know, pass to enlightenment or what have you, supporting diversity. I was very quick to say like, I don't have any biases. I'm very open-minded, I'm fine. And I had to sit down and I think about it. I was in a hiring position at the time or in a position to help make decisions about hiring. And after some introspection, I realized that if an older man walked in, uh, I immediately in my head thought like, oh, you know, he knows PHP 4 or something, you know, like he's not up to date on best practices, he doesn't know new code, he's obviously outdated. And that's crap. That's just as crap as somebody automatically thinking a woman walking into an interview is incompetent. And realizing that that was in me felt like crap. It didn't feel good, it did not make me feel okay. But once that I knew it was there, once I knew about it, I could fight it. So the next time an older gentleman walked in, I could immediately think like, okay, stop. Take away all your preconceived notions. Own your privilege. You know, I mentioned a number of times I grew up very poor um, and I worked really hard. I was a single parent. I was working full time, putting myself through college, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So when somebody tells me, own your privilege, I was quick to say, no, you can stuff that in your pipe, no. I don't have privilege. I fought for this, I worked for this, and I earned it. I'm not privileged. There's a really good way I found, though, to illustrate privilege. If I put a trash bin right here, and I gave all of you a wad of paper, I said, throw it in the trash can. And they might find it pretty easy. They had pretty good coordination. Um, maybe not. Uh, 
people back there would probably have a pretty hard time with it. Now, second row might find it moderately easy, but kind of difficult. Like, it's still hard. You're still trying to get that. And so you're thinking, like, I'm doing this pretty hard thing, and I'm doing it, and I'm barely making it, without ever knowing that there are rows of people behind you. And the fact that there are rows of people behind you for which it is much harder doesn't take away from your struggle. It doesn't make your life any easier. It's just the acceptance and the understanding that there are people behind you, people that have it harder. It doesn't take away from what you're doing. Work to educate yourself. Once you edu you've educated yourself, help educate others. Also, shut up. If you're in the majority, and then amplify the voices of others and help make their voices heard. Thank you.